Hello, everyone. We're just giving everyone a minute to sign on. We appreciate you joining us. We'll start in about 15 or 30 seconds or so. <clears throat> So we'll go ahead and get started. I wanted to thank all of you for being here with us tonight. Um, I also wanted to thank NANS for sponsoring this conversation. Uh, I also wanna thank our panelists for joining us. Uh, we have some amazing people, uh, some really good friends of mine, people I've worked with over the years, people I really respect um, and people that I've learned a lot from. Uh, and I also, lastly, I want to thank the Diversity and Outreach Committee for uh, really putting on and putting this group together. Um, so this is going to be uh, a financially wellness a financial wellness webinar. Excuse me. Um, you know, we're going to take a little break from a lot of the things that we traditionally talk about when we are together as a group, and we're going to talk a little bit about money, a little bit about personal finance. Uh, a lot of our panelists are going to share some of the lessons that they've learned over the years, uh, mistakes that they've made, and also give advice for anyone out there uh, who is trying to navigate this world as a physician and the challenges of really understanding how to take control of your finances. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Diversity and Outreach Committee is a committee of NANs that's really focused on improving diversity in our field, uh, both in science and in medicine. Uh, we're also committed to improving access to treatments, specifically neuromodulation, and we are hosting this webinar tonight in order to really have this conversation. And one of the reasons that we think that this is an important conversation for us to host is that um, a lot of underrepresented minorities um, often start out a little bit behind the eight ball um, and um, don't necessarily, and, and I'm speaking for myself specifically, um, I didn't necessarily have family members who could really mentor me on how to handle my finances when I became a physician. And so we're hoping that this conversation uh, will benefit our entire body of NANs and that anyone who has specific questions, feel free to put your questions in the chat and reach out to us. And hopefully we'll have a really awesome conversation about Kind of things that we're doing and things that we've learned over the years. Next slide. So as I said before, we have a number of panelists listed here. Um, as I bring them on to the conversation, I will introduce them and allow them to tell you a little bit more about themselves. Uh, I am Jonathan Gorey, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I am a chronic pain physician in Little Rock, Arkansas at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Uh, I am the director of the chronic pain division here, uh, and I wear a number of hats, including fellowship director, and I'm also chief of staff elect for our hospital system. Uh, I spoke of some of the webinar ground rules, but be sure to type your questions into the panel, uh, and I will be uh whenever it's appropriate i will bring those questions out they'll be answered either at the end of the webinar or sometimes in the middle if i think it's something pertinent so if you have a question that comes up at any moment please go ahead and let us know we're going to keep the audience on mute and we are going to publish this on our nans youtube page in 48 hours next slide this is our outline uh we're basically going to march through the career of a neuromodulator. And first, we're going to have a good friend of mine, Brian McKinney, who's gonna talk a little bit about kind of an overview of how to plan for your finances. Uh, then we're gonna have three panels. 
Uh, one is kind of an early career conversation. Going to have a current fellow and a new graduate talk about how they are handling their finances. We're going to have some mid-career conversations, which I was told yesterday that I am officially now mid-career, which kind of makes me a little bit sad. So I will join into that panel. And then we will talk a little bit about uh, with a more seasoned neuromodulator to discuss what the financial considerations are at that point. And then we'll have an open Q&A. Next slide. So I want to invite Brian McKinney on, who is a the co-founder of Collective Wealth Partners and allow him to introduce himself and allow him to take the floor. Thank you, Dr. Gory. I appreciate the uh, the introduction. Um, can, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? I'm assuming so. You're good. You're good. All right. Well, I'm excited to be here today. Um, as Dr. Gory said, I am a um, certified financial planner. I'm a partner um, and senior wealth advisor at Collective Wealth Partners, which is a Black-owned uh, registered investment advisor. So what we do is investment advisory and really comprehensive financial planning and you know tell you a little bit about my background but really i'm just here as a resource to just give you some things to think about as you're kind of moving through or transitioning through through life and and, and moving through your career some of the things some of the key financial things um, that you should be thinking about um, today and more about like what we do as financial planners. But just to give you a little bit of my a little bit of my background, uh, I've been a certified financial planner since 2006. Um, been in the industry since 2004. Started out as an investment analyst on Wall Street in New York, um, working with uh, ultra high net worth families, so 50, 100, 150 million dollar families, um, doing financial planning and estate planning. Uh, moved down to Atlanta to get my MBA from Emory in finance and real estate and worked as a portfolio manager for US Trust. Um, and managed about half a billion dollars in assets um, for high net worth families. Um, ultimately, you know, after working for a number of big companies, decided that I wanted to go out, um, wanted to, to, to work a different way, wanted to do things differently, wanted to focus on a different market that the industry really isn't set up to, to focus on. So although I'm in Denver, joined with a few other um, certified financial planners based in Atlanta, and we form Collective Wealth Partners. Um, it's kind of sad to say, but out of all the independent um, registered investment advisors out there, I believe we have the most black CFPs in one firm, and we have and we have four. Um, so excited to to talk to you all about um, financial planning, financial literacy, financial wellness. Um, give you some nuggets to think about as you're building, thinking about building wealth, um, not just for yourself but for your family. We can move to the next slide. All right, so three key questions, and I'm not gonna um, spend too much time on these because you have some great panelists that are gonna talk about kind of their journeys, and I think a lot of knowledge can be gained from those anecdotes and those kind of first-person narratives. Um, but some things to think about as you consider um, building wealth moving forward. So what does a financial planner do? Like, why are we here? Do we just sell things? Well, no, we don't, well, some. Some financial planners do sell things, um, but that is not what a core um, planner should be doing. We help you do. We help you uh, devise a strategy to achieve your goals, right? How? What are your goals? How are you going to prioritize those goals? How important are those goals to you? And what is the timing on those goals? So, what does that look like, right? Well, what do you hope to accomplish? What do you want to do with your wealth? How do you want to use your wealth? Because money is just a tool. Right? It's just a tool to help you um, get to where you want to get to, right? Money shouldn't be the, the end all be all. One of the things that I like about our firm is that we work with um, high income folks all across the country, right? It's important to us that the folks that we work with don't just want to build wealth for wealth's sake, but want to build wealth to better communities. So a lot of our um, a lot of our clients or households that we work with, families that we work with, you know, want to sit on boards and want to have an impact in their community that way. They want to raise money for nonprofits. They want to start nonprofits. They want to do things with their money to further mankind and further the communities from which they came. Right. So that is some of the, some of the goals. So how do we structure that? How do we think about that? How does that fit into your overall plan? But goals can be varied. Right. Maybe start your own private practice. I have a number work with a number of physicians around the country. And you know, some of the things that they want to think that they're thinking about is how do I make that transition? What's the trade off? What are some things that to think about? 
Um, maybe it's start another business, another side business. Maybe it's to build a real estate portfolio. Maybe it's to retire early, or maybe not retire early. Maybe it's to pay for a child's um, a, a child's tuition. Maybe it's to pay down your student loans. Maybe it's to, uh, what we see a lot in our community is to provide support for other family members, including, but not limited to you know, aging parents or aging relatives, right? Wanna make sure that we are providing for ourselves, but also, also a lot of times for high income folks in, in various professions, the folks that we work with, right? A lot of times they feel responsibility to help family members when they get in, you know, when they get stuck or they need, they need resources, they need money. So how do you plan for that and make sure that you are not taking away from your opportunity, your goals, your family's goals, and moving forward and building wealth and, and attaining financial independence and financial security. Um, some of the other things that, that the goals that could be out there, you know, um, protect yourself and your family from, you know, unknown catastrophes to the extent possible, right? We know things happen. Things happen in life. You can't plan for everything. But how do you put a proper risk management plan in place? to ensure that if something does happen, at least at least you have your bases covered, at least you've had those discussions, you have an idea of, of, the, of the game plan, should those things happen to you or somebody else in your family, right? So thinking about you know estate planning or like insurance, those types of things. Um, so we help prioritize, we help thinking about, think through those things. We have the benefit, the advantage of working with you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of families that are in similar situations as you, not everyone's situation is different, right? So not the exact situation, but similar situations as you, and we can talk about, you know, best practices so that you don't waste your time or waste waste money, right? How can we be of assistance? How can we help? Well, we help you stay on course, right? So we'll help you build a strategy, but that's not it, right? It's a living, breathing document. It's, 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 if it's just words on paper and nothing is implemented, then what use is it? Is it? Right, so we help bring that additional layer of accountability. All right, you said this was important to you, right? You said providing for your child's education was important to you. You said paying down your student loans, accelerate, if it makes sense, accelerating student loan down payments so that you feel better, so that you can breathe was important to you. Okay, well, this other choice is gonna take you away from that. So you can do that, but there are trade-offs. And so that's what we do. A lot of times that conversation for what I've seen is enough to kind of um, have folks take a step back and think like, is this the right decision? Sometimes thinking about that decision for the next two or three days or week or so will save you from yourself from making a decision that could be detrimental to your financial to your financial health. So, you know, how can we help? A lot of times it's accountability. Um, people think of financial planners and financial advisors, just investments. And yes, investments is a piece, but it's not everything. There's so many other aspects of your financial life that if you get the investment piece right, but you get the tax piece wrong, you get the estate planning piece wrong, you get the risk management piece wrong, and it doesn't matter if your investment returns are above the benchmark if they're 10, 20%, because you would have blown up your financial situation if you don't have those other pieces, um, others, other pieces uh, completed, other pieces implemented, and they all have to be dynamic. They all, all those pieces of your financial life have to be working together if you really do want to move, want to move forward. And then this last piece, this last piece, what should you be thinking about today? So no matter where you are in your career, I know we're going to talk about kind of those three different stages, but no matter where you are, you should be very clear on what your short, intermediate, and long-term goals are. What are those goals? What is it? What is it that you want to do, right? And then assess the time frame to those goals, assess the expense, how, what is the resources that are necessary to accomplish those goals? And then tactically, you got to think, think through, okay, well, how am I going to get there, right? What are the steps that I need to put in place in order to get there? And it doesn't matter how old you are. Like I talk to, you know, I do, you know, these talks to, you know, middle school and high school students, and I do them to folks that are retired. Right. And we always talk about always talk about what are the what are your goals? Write those down, because I don't have to tell you all. You all know you're much more likely, much more likely to accomplish your goals if you write them down versus just kind of keep them in your mind. So that is what you should be thinking about. First and foremost, before you're thinking about the latest investment craze, before you think about putting money here, putting money there, think about what is the big picture? What is it that you want to accomplish? And then think about the steps to get there. Right. And then what tools do you have at your disposal to get there? Right. So if it's retirement, 
what different types of retirement accounts do you have available to you? Is it a 401k? Is it a solo 401k? Is it a SEP IRA? Can you do backdoor Roth conversion? What tools do you have that are increased the likelihood of you being able to achieve those achieve those goals? Right? And then, you know, because of all the clients that I work with, they're all high income. All of them are high income. So we spend a lot of time talking about how can we minimize, how can we minimize our tax burden? Right? What are the things that we can put in place now that can minimize our burden today? But also, what are some things that we can do to minimize our tax burden in the future? All right, so think about you know, the difference between a traditional 401k contribution and a Roth 401k contribution. Different tax impact, pay tax now or pay tax later, but how are you going to um, decide what that breakout, what that ratio should be? Again, like you could definitely, definitely, there's, there's things out there you can read, you can do a lot of things on your own. I don't wanna be, I don't sell stuff, so I'm not selling financial planning, but I'm just trying to tell you where it could be valuable if it's somewhere where you need that, you feel like it's necessary to have that level of expertise. And then the last thing, because I feel like I'm talking a lot, I wanna get to the other panelists. Last thing you should be thinking about today, what risk management strategy should you be implementing? Right, we just came through a, through a pandemic, right? Even without a pandemic, there's still things that could happen and, and, and you all are physicians, so you understand things that could happen like that. Right? Do you have your estate planning documents in place? What about your, your will, your powers of attorney, your healthcare directive? If you need trust, if that makes sense for your particular situation, do you have all of those things drafted and executed? Because I'm telling you, you don't wanna be in a situation where you need those documents and you don't have them. Right. Everyone wants to think about the, 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 the exciting thing, the Bitcoin and the, and the, and the NFTs and like all those types of things. You got to get the, the, the blocking and tackling is really the estate planning. Cannot forget to do that part um, and make sure that you're reviewing that every year, even if you have those documents drafted. And if you move to a different state, if you move to a different state, you may need to. It's likely that you'll have to get those documents redrafted. Don't put that off. It's critically important. And then also insurance. Right. Something could happen to you. Um, where you pass away or you're incapacitated or you can't work, right? That's a lot of income off the table. So how do you ensure that your family is protected in the event that those things happen to you? Now, that was, that was a lot. Granted, that was a lot, but I'm going to be here and I'm going to kind of be chiming in and answering some questions as they come. But those are some things to think about in terms of what we do as financial planners and what you should absolutely be thinking about here today and tomorrow as you plan your financial future and your uh, for you and your family. I appreciate that introduction, Brian. I actually have a couple of questions before we get started, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, things that came up kind of in your conversation. Um, I think the first one is you talked about like how you manage a lot of clients who really want to impact communities. And can you yep. talk a little bit about kind of the challenges that uh, underrepresented minorities have when it comes to that kind of pressure to build wealth, but also to make sure that they impact for communities and give back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is, a, it is, it's a challenge, right? Because you mentioned um, Dr. Gore before um, with minorities and and people of color kind of getting into the uh, the profession and how they haven't had these discussions. And they, for many of them, their first generation high income earners. For many of us, first high first generation high income earners, right? And so for physicians that I work with and attorneys that I work with, they come out. So they're already a little behind just because they've been in school for an extended period of time. They're behind financially because they haven't had those years to, um, to contribute to their 401ks, right? They haven't had those years to, to contribute to their investment accounts. On top of that, on top of that, you have these high student loan debt loads that, they, that many of them have right, which feels like suffocating almost, right, because not only have they never had this money, made this much money before, they've never had this much debt before either, right, and it feels like it's a lot, right, and then, and then you have, I came from this community, I'm the only one, I'm the one doing well, I want to give back to this community, so you have, like, all of these different priorities, and I think you can do all those things, you can build wealth, you can pay down a student loan, and you can impact community, um, but you just got to prioritize, and you can't do them all at the same time, Right. And so what I talk to them about is, OK, you got to put your oxygen mask on first. Right. 
you got to you you have to get situated yes your student loans low interest rate debt let's just let that pay the minimum payment for now let that ride let's focus on offense instead of defense so let's build wealth let it accumulate then then we can think about accelerating student loan down payment then contributing you know financial resources to community impact but a lot of times it's like okay you can have community impact in other ways other than financial right you can invest your time so what boards can you sit on how can you contribute to some of these community organizations or these causes that you believe in if you have the extra time without without dedicating these resources early on right once you get later on in life and you're much more comfortable and you're caught up because you will catch up you start out late but you keep maxing out those 401k contributions you live below your means you will catch up financially you will start to build wealth so once you get to be like that middle career but i got a lot of clients that are like just out of school they just want to they just want to go it's like let's 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 hold off that's what the plan is for yeah no that that makes sense um I have one more question that I want to ask, and then I got a question in the chat. Yep. Um, you you mentioned, and I'm going to get into the weeds a little bit. You talked about insurance and making sure you're protected. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about, you know, how much should we have when it comes <laughs> to like, you know, term or whole life or all those sorts of things? Can you like, I know that's probably like a two hour question. But can you like give us a 30 second on, you know, for us to figure out like how much insurance should we carry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a good, that's a good question. Um, and it is very, I'll, I'll put this disclaimer out here for compliance purposes. I don't want to give specific, specific yes. advice, but a good rule of thumb of how much to have, you know, think about 10x. Think about 10x your salary. That is, that should be kind of a barometer or a rule of thumb right as you are thinking about the types of insurance and i am a i well the amount of insurance and i'm also a person that likes term insurance unless there's a very specific reason to um to purchase permanent whole life universal life insurance um i like term and invest the difference right you don't need the insurance product in order to be able to invest that's i mean that's just that's just me that makes sense that makes sense we had a question that came through in the chat and then we'll go to the panels. They wanted to ask, and it was a question kind of, they've heard a lot about some financial planners having fiduciary duties, some not. Can you yep. explain the difference between like what a fiduciary is and what a fiduciary duty is? Yep, yep. So you always wanna have a fiduciary. So as a, if you, if certified financial planners are required to be fiduciaries, we are required to do what's in your best interest. Right, and it might sound like, oh, okay, well, everyone does that. No, 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 everyone doesn't do that. Everyone's not required to do that. There are two different standards. One is fiduciary, which is up here, and the other is suitability. So just to give you a quick example, because um, now we're pressed for time, let's say you go out to buy a car, right? And you go to the dealership and you say, you know, I want, you know, I want this type of, I want this type of car. And the sales, the, 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 the salesperson, could say, okay, well, you want safety, you want um, you want this type of space, you want this gas mileage, you want all these different things, right? So this is the right car for you. That is fiduciary. The suitability dealer will say, oh, I'll just get you a car to get from A to B. I don't care about all that other stuff. It's just, it's a minimum standard. Forget all that other stuff that you're talking about. This is just gonna get you from A to B and that's good enough, right? Because it, it, it rides, at least for now, and you'll be able to move back and forth. So when you, work with an advisor one of the first questions that you need to ask is are they a fiduciary if they're a fiduciary then they are required to work in your best interest so they're not going to put their commissions or how much so how much they're going to make they're not going to put all of that in front of kind of your your needs so you always make sure if they're not a fiduciary they're a salesman you don't want to work with salesmen sales people sales yep. women salesmen I, I i got one more i know we need to move to our panels but i got one more really good question um, and it's a question about what, you know, as you're, and I remember this, as a resident, as a pain fellow, there's financial planners on you like hawks. You know, the minute I get on LinkedIn or I got on LinkedIn as a fellow, I'm looking for a job. It's like, I'm getting a message every day. Like, you yep. know, they know that I'm about to, you know, eventually come into a little bit of money. Um, what are some red flags? And I know you talked about the lack of being a fiduciary, are there any red flags that anyone should see that they're like, yeah, I probably shouldn't speak to this person, or this is a sign that I should speak to this person? Yeah, 
Number one red flag, if they work for if they work for an insurance company, you should walk away. They are salespeople. If they work for an insurance company, yes, insurance is important, but they will lead with insurance, insurance solution for every problem that you have. And it is expensive. Like I work with physicians, right? Um, and, and it happens with attorneys as well. These insurance folks are on top of them. And so they come to me and they're overinsured. They have all these expensive permanent policies. They're like, why do I have these? I don't know why I have these. Like it, 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 is, a, it is a mess. So if the, number one, if they are an insurance company, for me, that would not be who I would want to work with because they're going to sell you an insurance product, whether it's a whole life policy or an annuity that you don't need, um, that they don't even understand. So stay away from stay away from that. Um, and then ask how they get paid, right? Ask how they, and, and it's a valid question that everyone should ask. How do you get paid? Is it a, are you fee only, meaning that you only get paid from the client? Or are you fee-based or, or commission-based where some of your some of your pay could come from selling life insurance or selling some other products, selling mutual funds? You want fee only, or you could do fee-based as well. But if it's, if they get commission from selling these different products, my opinion, I think you should walk away. Thank you. No, that was a great answer. Um, I want to go ahead and invite our first panel uh, on camera, and that is Dr. Can Cam and Dr. Johnson, two people that I know exceedingly well. Um, welcome, Dr. Johnson. And I wanted to uh, welcome Dr. Can Cam. I wanted to give you both a chance to introduce yourself and tell your own story, where you're from, uh, what you're currently doing, uh, and then I'll get into a couple of questions. All right, thank you, I'll get started. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. Okay, perfect. So my name is Serafina Cancam. I'm from the Kansas City area. I'm currently practicing at the University of Kansas. I'm anesthesia trained. I did an interventional pain fellowship at the University of Arkansas and trained under the greatest Dr. Jonathan Gorey. <laughs> and um, I'm currently two years post residency and one year post fellowship. And I'm really excited to be here today to discuss financial wellness. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Johnson, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, sir. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Good. So uh, Trevor Johnson, I'm originally from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm um, anesthesia trained as well. I did my residency in New Orleans at Ochsner uh, Medical Center, and I am the current pain fellow at the University of Arkansas under uh, Dr. Gorey. Um, I'm also happy to share any gold nuggets and tips that I have for you. We'll just ignore the, the obvious theme here um, and get right into the conversation. Um, you know, I'll start with uh, you, Dr. Johnson. Um, you know, you're in fellowship, and and I know when I was in fellowship, I wasn't really starting to engage in these conversations yet. So I wanted to ask you, is there anything that you did during your residency to prepare for your financial future and anything that you're doing right now? Sure. Um, I think the biggest thing for me, the biggest turning point during a residency was I was uh, never the person to really make a budget or to really follow my finances. I would sort of passively check my bank accounts every now and then, make sure I'm not overdrafting, make sure I'm not getting too low. Uh, but making a budget was the, the biggest game changer for me and not even a, a proactive budget. It was more retroactive as whereas I would go a month uh, I started by backtracking all of my charges, everything kind of all of my um, everything I had to pay for pretty much and kind of on paper seeing like how much of my money was going to certain different things. And for me, it was fast food and going out to eat as much. I didn't realize how much money I was spending. Uh, and, I, I, and that kind of really changed my entire mindset of of how much money I'm saving. Uh, and so, like, again, I, I was not the 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 type A person to sit down and make a budget, but even that retroactive budget for me would give me enough information to make sure to know what I was doing wrong and what I could do better. That sounds good. Um, same question for you, Dr. Can uh, Anything that you did during your training that you think helped you set you up well for, for where you are right now? 
Yeah, I think the biggest thing was just trying to be proactive and learn as much as I can about financial literacy. It's something we don't learn much, well, depending on where you train, but overall, I feel like in medicine, we don't learn much about finances. So really what I tried to do is educate myself about finances, um, utilizing resources like the White Coat Investor, Prudent Plastic Surgeon, books, YouTube videos, um, following finance people on Instagram, um, having a financial planner and asking colleagues who have a pretty good background in finances when it came to um, financial literacy. And then um, also as what Brian Kinney was kind of explaining, it's important to kind of write down your goals. So especially when I was learning about the different type of investment strategies or different things I should be doing, at that time I'd also write down goals and also having the mindset that I should try to live um, below my means as much as possible. Um, I also think that, you know, really taking advantage of what's offered to us as residents. So if you, depending on your institution, if you have access to um, like an employee sponsored retirement account, especially if your institution also puts some money into that account, I would contribute to that or like a health savings account. Um, also uh, um, saving money and investing through a Roth IRA is something that I tried to do as much as possible during training, which I think um, was really helpful um, to be on the right foot when I started as an attending. Um, another thing that I thought was helpful is to just set up automatic investing or automatic savings. I think that when you don't see the money, you don't really know it's there. And when you're actually manipulating the money, it's, it hurts a little bit more and it's harder for you to save and invest. So it's just easier if everything is automatic so you don't see it and you don't really know it's, it's there. Um, I would say those are the biggest things um, that I did, I think, to kind of put myself on the right foot when I started after training. Also, the other thing is to um, try not to accumulate bad debt, um, to try to pay off my credit card bill each month and also getting disability insurance um, as a medical student or early in training is also something that was helpful as well. No, I think those are both great pieces of advice. and. Some of them I followed and some of them I did not. So uh, thank you for sharing them. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna bring this question back to you again, Dr. Can Cam. Um, you know, you're very early in your career, you're a year out, um, but have you started thinking about your retirement and how do you allocate money or how do you make the decision, especially at, at this point, how much to allocate towards life insurance and retirement and disability insurance and those sorts of things? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I think, you know, starting out, like I said, kind of doing the research during training and also meeting with the, like, you know, if you don't feel like you're well-versed in the topics, meeting with the financial planner and kind of getting an idea of what I should be doing and what I have available to me. So um, that's what I did when I started and also following that plan that I had during training. And so, as far as retirement, I think it's really good to have like a solid plan as early as possible. Um, you know, having the mindset that it's okay to want to splurge, but also you still want to live below your means when you start as an attendee. You don't want to spend all your money immediately. Um, and then I also had the mindset that I want to be able to retire when I want to retire. I don't want to feel like I'm forced to have to keep practicing in order to have you know, money to live on once I retire. So having that mindset, I tried to be a little bit, you know, right now I'm a little pretty aggressive when it comes to saving um, and investing into retirement accounts. So utilizing that mindset and kind of mapping out um, the different, you know, if with my with my work, you know, do I have a 401k, 457, um, you know, those different types of accounts. And then I try to get familiar with the, in the limits that exists for each of those accounts each year. And I try to max out every account that's available to me through work. Um, so that's the biggest thing that I would say when it comes to investing and also meeting with your, wherever you're working with your HR department and kind of figuring out the logistics that way, uh, trying to see if it's better to invest pre-tax or post-tax, et cetera, um, just so you're making those right decisions. Um, and then also when it comes to retirement, I think it's really important to remember that you don't want to you want to use like evidence-based advice when it comes to investing and also avoid like emotional-based decisions and manipula manipulations because you know whenever the market's not doing well it's really easy to kind of get scared or worried and want to try to pull out your money 
but try to think about the long term. So kind of also, you know, thinking that way and just putting your money aside and not touching it is the best way to navigate it. And then um, one thing I wish I would have started earlier was, you know, the, any extra money I have putting into a brokerage account and investing in index funds, um, I think is also um, very helpful. Um, and then as far, did you ask about life insurance as well? And yeah, disability? Life, life insurance, disability insurance. How did you make those decisions if you have? Yeah, so as far as life insurance, I think the right time to buy life insurance kind of varies from person to person. And it really depends on your family and financial circumstances. So some people do need it in their training or early attending years. Some people may not. Um, some people later, um, you know, for me, I just got life insurance because you know, I'm currently expecting a child. So usually when someone depends on your income, it's probably a good time to consider um, getting life insurance. Um, and then if you, you know, if you have any massive debt um, that will be carried after your death, that's also another good reason to have um, life insurance. But you kind of just weigh those factors and kind of decide what's right for you. Um, at that point, I decided to go with term life insurance, kind of like what um, Brian Kinney had recommended. That was the advice that I also got. Um, and it's also when you think that you'll need it, it's also better to get it as as early as possible because the earlier, the older you get, the more expensive it can be. And then on top of that, the older you are, the higher risk you are for you know getting sick or having some type of condition that can make you ineligible for some life insurance at that point. So when you think you need it, you're young, healthy, try to get it. And as far as disability insurance, I think that's something that's extremely important. Um, I uh, got disability insurance my fourth year of medical school. And some people were like, you know, as a resident or in your workplace, some places do offer you um, short-term disability, but you want disability that will follow you and is very portable um, when you practice. So, you know, even when you're young, yes, you can't predict the future. We're all human. We can be part of an accident, get into an accident at any time. And there may be a time where you can't necessarily practice your specialty, unfortunately, and you work so hard to get there. And when that happens, you still have bills to pay and other expenses. So you really want to protect yourself um, from any issues if that were to occur. So I think it's really smart to get your own disability policy. And maybe um, Brian can talk about, you know, own occupation um, policy, like the best disability policies to get. So something that you can get that if you can't practice your specific, so if I can't do anesthesia, if I can't do pain medicine, but let's say I can still do research or something, I would still get paid. Those are like the best policies um, that you can get. And it's also same like life insurance, the younger that you get it. So as a, you know, as a trainee, um, the cheaper the policy can be, they give, you know, pretty good discounts to trainees and then you're less likely to have a serious medical condition at that point. So it kind of locks in your insurability. Um, so I, that's, that's kind of like my viewpoint on disability insurance. Yeah, no, I, I think that was that was great. And I also wanted to add in uh, two things I wanted to highlight. One, I also think that portability is important, especially considering that, you know, over 50 percent of pain physicians and anesthesiologists end up changing jobs after their first two years. And so locking into a disability plan that you can take you can't take with you can potentially put you in a little bit can cost you a lot of money when you need to pick up a plan when you get to your new job. And the other thing I wanted to touch on is you talked a little bit about kind of splurging, but making sure that, you know, you live below your means. You know, one of my favorite philosophers, Sean Carter said, I won't buy it until I can buy it twice. And I think that's a good uh, rule of life to kind of live by. Um, uh, Brian, I think you were about to jump on and say a couple things. I wanna give you the opportunity. No, I, I was just gonna say Dr. Can Cam said it better than I, I could have. So <laughs> I, I think every everything that um, Dr. Can Can and Dr. Johnson have said, um, I agree, you know, hundred hundred percent. I think those are good points from the budgeting to you know getting insured sooner rather than later. And it's you need to have portable disability insurance policy. You have to be able to take it with you. Um, I think that is an option. If I'm meeting with a with a physician client and they don't have a disability policy that's like my first recommendation other than like an emergency fund it's like my first recommendation if there's room in the budget is for that disability policy a portable 
policy at that. So no, no, you, you guys are great. You, you, it's everything I would have said and better. Awesome, thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions for this panel. Um, uh, this I'll start with Dr. Johnson and I'll move over to Dr. Cancam. Dr. Johnson, you're, um, I don't know if you know this yet, but in, in about a year, you're gonna start a job. Um, and I wanted to kind of ask you if there are certain things that you're thinking about, and maybe a little bit early, and Dr. Cancam, you can talk about your experience and whether there were anything you wish you had thought about. Uh, things that are kind of like, things you want to look for in your first job. Now, obviously, you know, everyone looks at the salary, um, but are there other things outside of the salary that pertain to finances? Uh, whether that be vacation, whether that be uh, contributions to retirement, et cetera, that you think are important to look for or that you are going to look for when you look for your first job? Sure, yeah, I do think it, it's a little bit early for me, but uh, these thoughts are circulating around my head. Uh, I guess similar to what Dr. King came said is just gaining as much financial literacy as possible before heading in and making those decisions is important. Uh, in terms of things that I'm looking for, uh, like you mentioned, uh, is this company your job? Are they matching? Are, are they matching my 401k? How much are they matching? Uh, vacations, sign-on bonus is obviously an important thing uh, versus salary. Um, I've, he I've heard of something called tail insurance. I'm not sure what that is yet, but I, I heard that that's important in terms of uh, portability and moving forward. Um, I guess I would just say that those are the, the thoughts circling my head as a, a new fellow uh, just hitting the ground. Yeah, Dr. Canhan, same question. Yeah, I would say the same thing. So what was really most important to me, uh, like outside of, you know, a decent starting salary would be also just the overall compensation package, which includes like the retirement package, making sure that's something that's competitive with like what's in the area. Um, also um, time off, like vacation time, the CME time in order to, you know, you know, develop out, you know, outside of the operating room or is outside as being a pain physician, going to these um, different workshops and courses. Um, do they not only give you the time, but the financial support to do those things? Um, and then also other insurance coverage, like uh, medical malpractice and like people who are thinking about having families, like I said, I'm expecting. So like parental leave and um, short-term disability for like maternity leave. I think those things were also very important, especially for young physicians who, you know, will likely take time off for, for things like that. Yeah, no, I think those are great answers. I, you know, I just wanted to add a little, a little piece there. I think it's so important, as you said, Dr. Johnson, to really look at the entire package. And I think a lot of times we, we look at salary, but, you know, if somebody is matching your retirement at 10%, then you need to count, put that into account. Uh, if someone's not paying for your health insurance, then you need to take that into account. And so really look at all of the things that you are going to get from certain institutions or practices, et cetera, and things that you're going to eventually have to pay for and kind of look at what that number is. Because sometimes the higher salary may not necessarily, and then also kind of looking at the tax benefits uh, of different types of payment strategies and really understanding, you know, sometimes you're not really comparing apples to apples if that makes sense and brian do you have any comment on that at all yeah i was just gonna add that's a great point look at the whole package um also look at the hsa because a lot of employers will also make hsa contributions for you so don't just look at the 401k match look at the hsa contribution as well that's great that's great um i want to thank dr johnson and dr can cam hopefully you will stay on and if there's any questions at the end i'll bring you back but i want to thank you for being pretty open and honest about um, some of your financial decisions. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, now I want to move on to our second panel. Uh, these are two folks that I have a ton of respect for and that I have learned a lot from over the years, um, Dr. Diaz Ramirez and Dr. Campbell. So I wanna invite both of you to uh, join us um, Dr. Diaz Ramirez is going to be joining us via audio and Dr. Campbell is here on video. So I'll start with Dr. Campbell. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got to the place where you are now? Thank you so much, Dr. Gorey. Um, so I'm Dr. Neville Campbell. 
I'm a anesthesiologist as well as an interventional pain specialist. I currently practice in Las Vegas. I've been in Las Vegas since 2014, started a practice, uh, the Center for Wellness and Pain Care in 2015, and I'm the founder and CEO of this practice. We started small, but currently we have three locations across the valley, about seven providers and 50 plus staff members, and we continue to grow. Um, aside from that, um, I have dabbled um, somewhat constructively in several different areas. Um, so in addition to the Center for Wellness and Pain Care, I am part owner in several different uh, companies at this point. Um, uh, Calibrate IV Hydration just launched that um, about a year ago, and that's growing right now. That's a mobile IV hydration company. Um, there is a cannabis uh, cultivation uh, company that I'm also a part owner in, and that's happening here in Las Vegas. Um, um, there is the Nevada State uh, Triage Center, and that's a novel concept, which is more of um, mental health, but for almost like I'm urgent care for mental health. So that we just launched that, and um, not just, that's been launched for about two years now, and we're getting that up and off the ground. So that's happening. In addition to that, um, there's the Wellness and Rejuvenation Centers of America, um, which uh, plans are on the way right now for that. And that focuses primarily on um, regenerative medicine, um, IV concierge services, as well as um, you know, um, Botox and fillers, et cetera, the, the aesthetics medicine. And finally, um, I am also a part owner in a real estate company that um, we have um, a portfolio that manages, owns and manages both uh, commercial and um, um, real estate. So, you know, again, you know, I've been dabbling in several different areas aside from medicine, but, but our medicine is still my core practice. Aside from that, I serve as the assistant professor for the Tour University uh, School of Medicine, as well as an assistant professor for our Rosemary uh, School of Medicine on medicine as well and i'm on, on a bunch of boards uh for non-for-profits etc so in summary i just like to have fun while doing good work i have about 15 <laughs> questions for you based on all the things you just said some of them i'll ask you online but i, I will ask some of them in a minute but i want to give dr diaz ramirez a chance to introduce herself um so uh can you tell us a little bit about your journey Hey guys, thank you for having me here. I do exist. I'm in the sky, like Jonathan said somewhere. It's like Floating the video. Around. Yeah, the video doesn't work in the in the cell phone. But here I am, and I'm very happy. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm in interventional pain management for uh, physicians for over 20 years, and I'm happy to say that I'm still considering mid career. Not like you, Jonathan. You're just coming in. I'm I'm still mid career, and um, I'm here because I'm part of the NAS Diversity and Outreach Committee. I'm very happy uh, to serve. Uh, in the art committee. I do have um, uh, the creator of the podcast, Design Your Physician Life, and we give physicians specific tips that they can immediately use uh, in an, their entrepreneurship uh, journeys. I'm also creator of the Max Saloon Mastermind, which is basically a six month program where we help physicians regain and retain control of their lives through entrepreneurship. So we provide support, accountability, and coaching uh, to these physicians. Uh, I'm also, uh, you know, a professor for the Florida State uh, University, and I own what's called the Sahavida Institute, which is an innovative medicine um, practice where we practice lifestyle, functional, regenerative medicine, and aesthetics. And uh, that's why I'm here. So thank you for having me. No, thank you. I I, I want to ask both of you the same question to start with. Um, you know, I'm an academics, so. Um, you know, I always think that medicine is one of the most risk averse careers. Um, and uh, it's because you're always going to have a job. You know, people are always going to need our help. Um, but I think that you take on a lot more risk when you decide to either start your own practice or start your own business. And I've done some of that, but my primary income is from, you know, a university. So I'll start with Dr. Diaz Ramirez and I'll go to Dr. Campbell. But can you talk a little bit about um, the challenges in making the decision to start your own business um, and also some of the lessons that you learned, both positive and negative? Well, I have to tell you that I've been an employee at the university, 
I've been an employee for uh, for hospitals, for uh, you know, talking about changing your life, and then they were talking about that uh, tail coverage. You guys have to make sure that you have that tail coverage because that was 20 years ago. That was a $25,000 pretty painful thing to go through. Um, that's how much a tail coverage can cost you. Um, we, you know, we can talk about that later. But I've been an employee in all these uh, sections, and I've been an employee for uh, a multinational, like not a multinational but basically a publicly traded company and I really found that I'm not a good employee I'm really an entrepreneur and making that decision you have to make a decision of how to lead your life in my case I was living my life by love you know love with my family and everything but also by certainty certainty of having that check but in that certainty I was really not being true to myself I was very unhappy in that situation because I was not able to uh, bring the creativity, the the entrepreneurship skills that I have developed through the years, not only on these things, but other enterprises that we've had. Um, and I was really trapped there. So it wasn't the company's uh, uh, fault. It was really my fault that I was really trying to lead my life like that. So once I made the decision to lead my life by love still, but contribution, then that decision of having my own business becomes more you know it becomes easier however um, one thing that has made a whole difference which i didn't have was having a team and a team of good lawyers fiduciaries to get to my fiduciary i really had to go through someone who told me that as a young physician i didn't have enough money i went through someone who told me that to make money you know like to accumulate wealth, I would have to buy, basically purchase things at a, at a flea market. And I had someone who also told me that, you know, it was that, uh, what Brian was talking about was that insurance uh, salesperson who was paid on commission, who told me that my house was my big investment, which is not true. Your house is really not an asset, it's a liability. And I was trapped in all those things. So making that, uh, that turn in mindset, is the first thing that we work on on our mastermind and getting the financial education. Those things allowed me to be where I am with my business. Uh, it makes it easier. And then getting around, surround yourself with people who really know what they want, who are like-minded people, who want to be the same, you know, in the same ways that you are. If you surround yourself with all the time these complainers, people who are not, you know, you can love your family, you can love your friends, love them from a distance, but if you want to really be somewhere different and you know you can do these things, surround yourself with the correct people. So my making all those changes, first changes in mindset, financial education, surrounding myself with the right people, then that made it much easier to go and transition again to where I am as an entrepreneur. Dr. Campbell, uh, the same question to you. I mean, you know, you came out and, and started your own practice. so. You said, forget the risk averse thing. I'm, I'm going to jump right at it. Can you talk a little bit about that decision and what you've learned? I mean, it's a great question. And I believe that, um, you know, uh, you know, everyone needs to s somewhat understand who they are. Right. I think. And that is the challenging part, knowing who you are, knowing what you want to accomplish and understanding your purpose. I think once we go through that process and figure that out, then the rest becomes just a grind to get to where we want to get to. Right. Um, it's not a matter of, um, you know, how we will find a way how it's not a matter of, you know, will we it's a matter of when because we will get there. But the drive has to be there. I came out of fellowship and uh, you know, I worked for one year and then I, you know, I launched my practice. Um, it was scary. Launching a practice is not easy. I mean, there's a lot of considerations. You have debt, you, have, you know, I had a family with kids to take care of. And so the uncertainty um, was real. But, but what I knew was who I am and what I was setting out to accomplish. And I was betting on myself. And I knew that betting on myself, I'm the best person that can bet on me because I know that I would not fail me. Now, starting a private practice and being in private practice, is it the easiest thing? It is not. Sometimes it is more work. As a matter of fact, in the initial stage of having your private practice, I would submit to say it is more work than working as an employee. It is far more work because your hours are never nine to five or eight to five or seven to three or whatever. No, your hours are, you know, you, you're up at the crack of dawn 
right? And you're at your either your phone, your computer, you're working until midnight. But again, that's the initial grind. So you need to have that. You need to know that this is what you want to do. And you need to be able to stick with it through those tough times. The first three years will definitely be the trying period where most people will walk away from it because it's not, it's not designed for everyone. So again, the key is to understand who you are and what you want to accomplish. Um, I think Dr. Ramirez asked said it really well earlier. Once you've figured out who you are and what you want, but then it's how do I get there? Find mentors. Surround yourself with people who has, you know, who have done what you're trying to do because they'll give you insight. Genuinely, there are people around like us who will share with you the path on how we got from point A to point B, how we navigated some, some difficult times, and we can even give you tips on how to avoid some pitfalls because we've been there when, you know, and we've done that. But you first have to figure out the how. Now, once you've done that, then the rest becomes great because once you've passed those first three years of the toughness and intensity of starting a practice, owning a business, things are moving, now you can begin to play around a little bit. Now you can begin to have multiple sort of revenue silos, right? I, I, I think Dr. Ramirez said earlier that having a house is not an asset. Anything that takes money away from you is not an asset. And so the goal is to create multiple revenue silos, I call them, that are producing for you. You buying that house where you're paying mortgage, that is you, that's a liability because it's taking money away from you, right? You doing anything that, you know, that car, that's taking money away from you because it's because it's depreciating immediately, no matter how beautiful it is, right? So how do you set up different structures? And they don't all have to be medicine. Think outside of the box just a little bit, right? Let medicine be your platform, but use this platform as a springboard to engage into several different opportunities, right? Find the right people though, let them lead and be the people, you know, you know, and be the person to walk with them or to support them as they lead the initiatives that you truly believe in. No, that was great. And thank both of you for those answers. Um, I want to get into the weeds a little bit uh, of, of uh, for so I'll start with you, Dr. Campbell. Um, how specific is your plan? Um, you know your financial plan. How do you make decisions about investments, creating wealth, uh, buying assets, starting new companies, and then also how do you plan for your future and for your family? Great question. Great question. So. Um, you know, I would say, you know, my plan right now um, is a very um, eclectic and broad and it's very eclectic. It's all over the place. Of course, it's not without direction. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's 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 far from simple. It, it will take a couple of advisors as well to sit down and comb through what I have going on, because because the plan really is in my head as to where I want to go. Remember, when it comes to financial planning. Right. I think one of the mistakes we make is we rely on the planners to plan our future financially. And I think that's a grave mistake that we make. We need to know where we want to go and with their assistance and advice, navigate how we're trying to get there. And so I think for a lot of young doctors who are hearing this presentation right now, think about what you want and what you're trying to accomplish. And then once you have that, then you can go to your financial planner with specifics and then they can then layer that with what they know, with their expertise to help you to get to where you're trying to get to. For me, I, it's, it's so diversified that sometimes I lose track. Thank God that my wife is available. And so she, you know, in the background, she's assisting with, okay, okay, you're doing this now and what are you doing now? And all these things that I'm doing, she's keeping a track of all of these, monitoring them as as this crazy mind of mine, you know, engages, engages, engages. Yes, do I have a 401k? Yes, we do. We offer one with our company. Um, do I have multiple life insurances? And of course, I was a victim to one of those guys who worked for an insurance carrier initially when I just started out. And they sold me the world. They sold me everything and I bought everything and I got stuck into all these things, you know, but 
but thank God with business and business doing well, you know, you can always scale back and do more, but that's costly because if your, if your income is not scaling accordingly and you're locked into different, you know, vehicles, then that's kind of where you're going to be locked into, right? Remember in a salary position, you have a capped salary and even, yeah, even if you give five or 10 years, you will not go beyond a certain point. So if you lock yourself into these very, very expensive investment vehicles, then you limit what you can then reallocate to different areas. So you need to be mindful of that, right? And have conversations with, with again, with people who are at destinations where you think you want to get to or moving along the pathway. So again, I do have a lot of different uh, components to my investment portfolio. You know, those are the basic ones that most of us should have, right? As a physician, disability insurance, that's not even a question. You must, you must, you must. Find a good person, discuss it, get some, and get the highest that you possibly can because we never know what may happen, right? For a 1K, naturally you should have some of that. Have some stocks. Have some stocks that are, you know, stable, you know, and have some stocks that are at this stage in our life. I believe that, you know, at your young stage, be risky a little bit. You can afford to be risky, right? You can afford to take some risks. And if you put money somewhere and it gives some sort of return, take it out for heaven's sakes. That's one of my biggest mistakes, right? You know, you start seeing returns on some investments and you decide, oh, you know, I'm going to leave it for 10, 15 years. Forget about 10 to 15 years. Who knows what might happen? Take it out, right? Or bring it back to your initial position and then the, 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 the profits that you've extracted, redistribute, put those somewhere else and leave your position where it is because if it's gonna grow, it's gonna continue to grow versus running the risk of leaving it there and a couple of years later, it evaporates or it's half the amount that you put in. I've seen that happen so many times in my short time of investing that now when I see things growing, I just take it out and bring it back to where I invested initially. And then what I made, I just reallocated that. A tough lesson to learn, but so, and it's hard because we see movement and we want to keep it. We believe that the future will continue happening and it probably won't. Yeah. The stock market has shown us that it won't, it's, it's a cycle. So when it grow, when it climbs, take it out for heaven's sakes. And um, you know, the, the last thing I'll say on this is, you know, with those investment vehicles that you have, right, vet them properly. So aside from the stocks and some bonds, you know, yes, I have some coins uh, that, that, that I have doing different things for me, but I have companies, people that I believe in and believe in their work ethic and believe in their vision and their drive, right? And I'm investing in them because I know they're like me. They will not fail at what they're doing if they have the appropriate resources. And so I become either a, you know, you know, a solid investor or, you know, a partner in an opportunity. And of course, I'm there watching and guiding and providing my expertise as well, watching them do the work as they grow and lead this operation, which they're truly passionate about. I'm just providing them some financial you know, assistance and they're giving me a portion in return. I have several of those areas set up that are non-medical because I believe that medicine is great. I love medicine, but it, but it provides us a platform, like I said, because we're high earning you know, uh, people. So it gives us that platform, but you gotta use it wisely. You gotta use it wisely. And no, last thank you. No, go ahead. Last, um, you asked about planning for the future. I think that was the last question you asked about how do you plan for the future, right? So, you know, I'm, I, and this is somewhat controversial, but people say, how do you plan? You know, you know, are you planning for retirement? I don't know, man, that's so far away. That's really far away. Like right now, what are we doing right now? I'm not saying to be carefree and live irresponsibly and squander, but these are our best years of our lives, right? We should take the opportunity to make use of these formidable years that we have, right? We've studied for 40, for 20 plus 20 years, we finished training, we're finally out. Now we're ready to do a practice and to practice. But we've, but we've spent 40 years getting to this point. And so now you're at this point, you're gonna save, 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 and put away and put away to when you're 60 so that you can, or 65, so that you can just, um, 
you know, use the latter portion of your life to enjoy whatever you've saved. I'm sorry, I don't buy that concept. I believe that I plan strategically, right, for what might happen in the future. But I also make sure that right now, right, I'm not overliving my means, but I'm not under valuing or treating myself. I do travel a little bit. I do get away with the family a little bit. Take time for you and your family because that's important. You don't know what tomorrow holds, right? I mean, look at people like, let's say, Steve Jobs, right? I mean, I, I think he can retire. I mean, you know, he could have retired 100, million, you know, 100 times, right, over and over and over with the money that he has, but has he been able to really use that, right? The question is, what is important to you in your life right now, right? Don't waste the years that we have working, um, you know, 20, 20 hours a day for 20 years just to say for what will happen after 65 or after whatever time. Take time to enjoy what you're making now or some of it with your family and with yourself because you never know what tomorrow might hold. Thanks. No, I, I think that's great and I appreciate it. Um, in the, I, I think one of the things you really touched on is kind of having a dynamic plan based on, you know, what's going on, what opportunities you have, and also focusing on not just saving for retirement, but also focusing on building wealth, which you are clearly doing a great job of doing. So I wanna thank both you, Dr. Campbell, and also Dr. Diaz Ramirez. Um, and I will come back to you if we have any questions toward the end. Thank you very much, please stay on. Thank um, you. I wanted to Thanks. invite Dr. McDowell on uh, and also give him an opportunity to say hello to everyone and talk a little bit about his journey. Uh, and then I have a couple of questions for him. Sure. Um, good evening to all. Um, Gladstone McDowell. I practice in Columbus, Ohio. I uh, did my anesthesia training in uh, Denver at the university there and uh, my pain fellowship at uh, Ohio State, actually the Ohio State University. Um, I, I, it's interesting, when I finished my fellowship, I, I joined the anesthesia group as one of their, their two pain physicians. I was supposed to 50-50. After about four months, I moved to 100% pain because there was a need. After a couple of years, I, um, I, I left the group and the next day started a private practice because the dynamics just weren't favorable. Um, the day after I started a private practice, the hospital came to me and said, we want you to come and come back to the hospital, take over the pain service and be an em em employee and we'll run everything, we'll pay you a great salary. So I did that for about seven years. I built a massive practice. I started with myself and a 19 year old and about Seven years, I had five providers and about uh, 40 staff. Uh, really hard to keep to keep uh, partners because we were covering the inpatient service, which seemed like a great idea when I came out of fellowship, paying committees and, and, and team meetings and, and all of these things. And I started a PCA service, an epidural service. All of that was a huge amount of, of work. The hospital didn't really want to hire any more people. I had people leaving. So I marked a very smart registered nurse and she, she pointed out the facts of life to me that I had three small kids and I, I was not available and I needed to figure it out. So I went into private practice. I did a couple really interesting things. So when, when we had a first child, I, I started to put money away from him. I started with Janus funds when I was at, uh, when I was doing my, my, my residency in, in Colorado. And, you know, as Dr. Campbell and some other people said, so I did aggressive Janus funds. I did in international funds. I started with $500. And by the time I ended my, my residency, I had about $18,000. Okay. That was all in my son's name. Um, I moved to, to Columbus. Um, one of the first things that, that we did was we, we met and we did uh, wills 
and trusts with uh, one, one of the top firms here. Um, and then I continued my, my concept of, of contributing and I put money into the, the 529 fund. So Ohio and multiple places have 529 funds. And I, I have to say that's probably, it's probably the best investment that I, I have done because I started contributing initially $500 per child and then $1,000 per child. So you're talking about $3,000 a month. Then I went to $1,500, okay? And I had to have serious conversations with my wife why I was putting away that much money. I got, I took disability insurance that I had from my, my, my residency and my fellowship that was inexpensive and covered me if I couldn't do surgical type things. And I, I increased that. I, I got great life insurance. And again, I made the mistake that um, I think Brian talked about was, you know, I got life insurance from a life insurance person and I got lots of, of, of life insurance. Um, I, one of the anesthesi, a couple of, of the anesthesiologists, and this was during the, the dot com boom, they were all saying, oh, listen, you should, you should invest money here, you should invest money here. I didn't pay attention to them, but what I did was I found a very good financial consultant. The mistake that I made, I listened to Brian talking about high net worth people, high net worth uh, uh, people. So the person that I initially invested with, they did high net worth people. They didn't really focus on people like me. And so over time, I counted on, on them to watch my, my investments. And I'd look at my investments and I would realize that they were dwindling. It's interesting. I wanted to invest in this company called Apple because I had an iPod and I thought it was the greatest thing. And they said, no, you need to do Microsoft and you need to do you know, Nortel and, and all th these other companies o over time. I watch Apple go up and I watch these other stocks go down. But again, I was not a you know fifty million dollar person, so I, I didn't I didn't really get get the benefit out of that. But so I, I did private practice. I funded my kids my kids uh, uh, schools and my big focus. And I want to 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 say this is that you know I, I was married. I felt a, a great responsibility to my wife and, and children to make sure that should anything happen to me, there, there, there was good life insurance. I had disability insurance, should anything happen, and, and I couldn't I couldn't use my hands, I could use, still use my mind and, and my, my, my mouth. And so I invested in, in that and I did that aggressively. When I was single, I had a great house. And when I sold my house, um, a, two years into my marriage, I made a lot of money. And I took several hundred thousand dollars. I dumped it into a, a big house that we, we built for a growing family. I had one child and then we had twins. That was a very good investment. I resisted buying a new car and putting the, the, the deck on. I put a lot of money into my house so that basically my mortgage was my salary when I was a fellow, okay? Mm -hmm. So I could I could manage it, all right? Um, th that that took some buy-in from the wife, uh, but you know she she bought into that. Um, so let, let, let's talk about things that didn't work so well. So I, I had this massive practice. I was recruited by a a neurosurgery group to come and join them. Okay, and that seemed like a great in investment. I could buy into a surgery center, I could buy into a building, I could buy into physical therapy, buy into MRI. There are cultural differences. And after a year, that just didn't seem to be a good fit for us. And so I transitioned into a purely private practice, but I managed it so I could take care of my family. I found, I found good accountants. I'd recommend you get a great accountant. I found a good healthcare attorney and a, and a personal attorney. You need to find, and I went through several accountants, so you need to find an accountant that will work with you. So I had accountants that would say, well, we can only meet at nine or 10 o'clock. And I go, that's in the middle of my day. Can we meet in the morning? Can we meet in, in, in the evening? No, 
So I found a healthcare attorney that would have breakfast with me at 6.30 in the morning, or we would have we would have a beverage and some appetizer at 6.30 in the evening. And I found an accountant who would do that also. I found a strategic, um, it's not really a wealth ad 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 advisor. I wish I had known somebody like Brian who could take care of a little guy like, like me, but I found somebody to, to help me strategize. Um, and I know that our, our time is short, so I'm gonna kind of run through some of these things. Um, I, 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 again, grew my practice to a massive size. I moved to a bigger space and I had the concept, and this was back in 2014, there was no pain specific surgery center. So I tried to get doctors to come together and nobody wanted to do it. I, I was tired of wasting time. So I found a, 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 a minority partner who had surgery centers and I took the, the risk and I built a pain specific surgery center. But I bought into the building that I was in and I bought into some of the land around it, okay? We sold the building in a year and a half, made a lot of revenue off of that and so I was able to to, to capitalize on that. Um, probably the best financial decision that I think I made was contributing to the 529 plans because I have three children and of course they all decided to go to three private schools, not to state schools. And I said, fine, I want you to do whatever you want to do. I want you to be happy. And your mother and I have committed to making sure that we are going to support you so you go through school without any debt, okay? We didn't have that growing up, but that's what we, we wanted to do for you. And so that's what I did. Beautiful thing about the 529 plans were when it came time to send money to California or New York or Cincinnati, I called them on the phone. I said, cut a check for this, cut a check for this, cut a check for this. I'd call up, I'd say, cut a check for the Apple store to buy these three MacBook computers. So you can use a 529 funds for a lot of, of your kids' educational needs. Um, I really did not spend any of our savings educating our children. They've all done very well. I don't have to take care of any of them anymore. And I hope that uh, they hire me as their chauffeur because that's my, my perfect retirement job. Um, so um, the, the other thing I want to talk about, and I'm not sure how much time we have, but I think it's important to get somebody like Brian, get some of the consultants that I talked about, but also look at some asset protection because besides the, the property and things that I've done involved with a cannabis company and a few other projects there but look at asset protection to to set up trusts and um, um, family family funds there's there's some ways to set things up there's some tax benefits there um, you need to have a, a good tax attorney you need to have a, a good accountant there but those things have helped to give me some sense of of uh, of, of comfort in that Hopefully things will will continue to, to progress well. Um, you have to involve your spouse and your partner at every stage. You know, I had a partner once who made a decision to do something and move to another state to another practice. Didn't talk to his his, his wife, and that was a very costly mistake for him. Um, uh, I think it's important for us to um, to strategize with our spouse or or our partner. And again, you know, to Dr. Campbell's point, you know, I'm the visionary. I figure out here's where I want to go, that's where I'm going, and then I figure out how to get there. I can't plan it out on a piece of paper. I have to figure out I want to do this, then I backtrack and I fill in the plans. My wife wants to see the paperwork. She wants to see the plan okay that's very good for me because she pulls me in she makes me think about it i take the vision and then i make i mold it into jello and then in, into cake and then into a brick so i think in involving your, your your spouses there and then the last thing i will close with is that you know starting a private practice or any venture or business and i found that i didn't think i was smart enough to run my own show but 
after two years, I have always been the medical director of everything that I've done. And I figured out that I have a larger size, a larger right brain than I thought of. And I can think of things, and I can figure things out. So you, you've you got to develop some confidence in yourself. It's hard to do, but you're going to make mistakes. You just have to keep going and keep going and keep going. And remember, there's a thin line between obstacle and opportunity. And the wise people figure out how to make both of those work for them. That was absolutely awesome. And thank you very much for that, especially that last piece of advice. Uh, yeah. I wanna thank you, Dr. McDowell, for giving us your words of wisdom. Um, and we very much appreciate it. And I have about 15 questions for you, but I will ask them offline or some other time. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, I wanna bring Brian back uh, for one more moment uh, before we close, because we're running short on time. Um, but Brian, uh, we have a question in the chat based on something that Dr. McDowell touched on. And that was kind of asking about your opinion about 529s. Um, you know, I personally have one. Dr. McDowell talked about how he benefited. But do you recommend kind of saving up front, or is there some benefit for taking out loans for your children and paying them on the back end? Great question. I mean, I have 529s. We have them for for our kids. If that that answers your question, I think Dr. McDowell is 100% right. I think it's a great vehicle to say for a child's education um, for a number of reasons. Um, one of the reasons it's so powerful, well, there's a couple of reasons it's powerful. Um, one is when financial aid is um, evaluated, there are two different types of assets, a student asset and a parent asset. A parent asset is, is the calculation expects you to contribute more of a student's asset versus a parent's asset. So what you would want is you would want more things to be to be categorized as parent assets. If you put those if you if you put those contributions, you open an account for your child in their name, like just a regular investment account, that's a student asset. Financial aid is going to be say, you know what, we want, we expect 50% of that, 70% of that, those funds to be count to be used for the child's education. It's a much lower percentage as a parent's if it's a parent's asset. The 529. The 529 is classified as a parent asset. So it so it has less of an impact on a student's financial aid. Now, who knows what financial aid is going to be out there anyway, um, particularly for high-income folks. But that is one of the benefits is that a, a 529 is a categorized as a parent asset. The other thing is that it is the money that you put into a 529 grows tax deferred, really tax-free if it's used for qualified education expenses, as Dr. McDowell said. So you have a long time horizon. If you start that at age, let's say age zero, right? And then you contribute over 18 years, that's 18 years of tax-free growth that you can use to pay for qualified education expenses. And some folks say, well, what if my kid you know, doesn't wanna go to college? Okay, well, you can always pull out your contributions tax and penalty free. You put in, let's say you put in $10,000, it grows to $15,000, you can always, take out that $10,000 tax or penalty, tax or penalty free if the kid doesn't go to college or doesn't go to a, because sometimes, because now there are some um, trainings that are qualified as qualified education expenses, right? And I think in the future, as, as, as things open up, as the landscape in higher ed kind of broadens, I think that there'll be a lot more leeway for those 529 expenses going forward. The worst thing that could happen with a 529, you put money in over whatever time period and your child doesn't go to doesn't go to college, you take the money out, you have to pay tax, which you would have to pay tax anyway if you didn't put it in a 529. And then there's just a penalty, but who cares about a penalty? 10% penalty is not the end of the world. The benefits more than outweigh the cost. And in certain states, so every state has a 529 plan, some states allow you to take a state tax deduction, so that helps as well in the year that you make the contribution. Some states don't allow that state tax deduction, but either way, I'm a proponent of 529s for higher education expenses, a way to save for kids um, for all those reasons. Um, I would put it, I would definitely put that in your tool belt if you're thinking about you know, the, the, the future cost of education, which we know is continues to go through the roof. 
Uh, someone also added just to kind of add to the conversation about how the beneficiary can be changed over, and that's another benefit of 529. If you roll yeah, easily. It. All you got to do is fill out a form, and you can change the beneficiary. And it doesn't even have to be it doesn't have to be your child that you. A lot of times it is a different child that you change the beneficiary to, but it doesn't have to be anyone in your family. You can change the beneficiary if you're helping another family member, or helping a a friend, whatever it is. There's so much flexibility in a 529. It's unbelievable. That's great. Um, I wanted to, there's one last question about 529s and just as a quick answer, because we're running short on time, we're actually over. Um, is there a best state to kind of do your 529 in? I know that's something that I, I, I've gone through, um, but I don't, I don't know if you can answer that question, but if you can. Yeah, I mean, there's research, uh, there's research out there. The thing that will make it a bad plan is if it has high, if the funds within the 529 have high expenses. Um, but you know this, the the state tax deduction you would only get if you invest in a 529 in the state where you reside. So keep that in mind as well. If you live in Oregon and you invest in a California plan, you're not going to get an Oregon state tax de state tax deduction. But for the most part, by and large, 529s for the most part are are, are pretty much the same in terms of the funds and the, the performance. Perfect. Thank you. We'll go ahead and close on that. I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, I wanted to also uh, give everyone an opportunity to get involved with the Diversity and Outreach Committee. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, there's a Google form that you can click on on the slide, and we will email that out to everyone that registered. Uh, you can either, uh, and it's also sent out in the chat box, so uh, we would love to hear more from you and uh, work with you to plan future events like this. Also, we have some pipeline awards that will be available in September if you want to attend our annual meeting. And the last thing is we have a reception. We'd love to meet you. I think most of us will be there uh, and we would love to see you at our annual meeting on January 12th through the 15th in Las Vegas uh, at Caesars Palace. And we will have a doc reception on the 12th. Again, I want to thank you for joining us. I apologize for going a little bit over, but our panelists were so amazing. I wanted to make sure they gave us as much wisdom as possible. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thanks, Dr. Gorey. Good, Good job. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Have a great day.